good morning uh, good afternoon and good evening everyone uh, depending on the time zone you're in uh, welcome to the 14th sankal global summit and uh, to a very interesting session on uh, financing interventions uh, for scaling up solar in the developing world in the emerging economies uh, my name is asha i'm a manager with intelicap and uh, i along with uh, uh, my fellow panelists and and uh, santosh will be taking you through this session uh to give you a little bit of context on uh, what solar energy and is and how important it has become um solar energy has rapidly become the front running renewable energy technology enabling a conscious conscious shift away from fossil fuel based power generation and for electrifying underserved populations it has also assumed a pivotal role in the journey to achieve ambitious climate targets especially in the emerging economies steep decline in technology costs favorable policies and economies of scale are key drivers that have enabled extensive solarization of the power sector in many countries including india however inequitable access to finance for solar development continues to hamper its growth in the developing world today we gather here to explore the pertinent issue of achieving the three c's for scaling up solar in emerging economies capital commercialization and collaboration with this i welcome everyone to the session on financial interventions required for scaling up solar in the developing world we have a brilliant uh, address by dr ajay mathur who was supposed to join us uh, live but due to uh, due to prior engagements he was not able to i will quickly take a minute to uh, introduce dr ajay mathur although he needs no introduction uh, dr ajay mathur is the director general of the international solar lands he earlier headed the energy and resources institute and the indian bureau of energy efficiency and was responsible for mainstreaming energy efficiency in houses offices and industries through a number of innovative initiatives He was leading a climate he was a leading climate change negotiator and was the Indian spokesperson at Paris climate climate negotiations. He served as an interim director of the Green Climate Fund during its foundational period as well. We will now hear a video recorded message uh, by Dr. Mathur uh, for our benefit. Jay if you could please play the video. Colleagues I am sorry that I am not able to join you in person at Sankalp. Uh, when this session is occurring, I will unfortunately not be uh, in the country and therefore be unable to join you. I wanted to first of all thank uh, Intellicap and all our partners in the larger investment space for all the help and support. that you have provided us in the past years on developing finance for the solar sector this has been a particularly difficult issue in the year 2021 for example we saw something of the order of 200 billion dollars worth of investment flow into the solar sector globally however 75% of this was to oecd countries and china only 5% went into all of africa despite the fact that this is the continent which has the best solar insulation this is the continent where the largest growth in energy supply is occurring and we wanted to know why intelicap helped us we spoke to something of, of like over 100 investors and understood that it is the lack of confidence maybe a perceived confidence that investors have about getting their money back it is the lack of a pipeline of projects that they are worried about it is the huge amounts of time that it takes for projects to be approved that the investors are worried about this has helped us in creating a mechanism a risk mitigation mechanism which can help money flow for solar projects together with intelicap we have developed a a a, a mechanism which essentially con contains three 
buckets of financing. The first bucket of financing is about risk mitigation. This is the most important part. And here we are looking at getting resources, grant resources, which can provide payment guarantee mechanisms in various countries and some kind of an initial premium paying mechanism for buying insurance for those solar plants. These help in building up the confidence that investors have in investing in developing countries. The second bucket is about capacity building. This is again grant financing which helps in project building, which helps in the creation of capacity so that people can prepare projects, bankers can evaluate the projects and policy makers can create the kind of environment that is needed for uh, solar developers to earn a decent return. The third bucket is about enabling the change, the capacity building and the investment that is needed. Investors often say, right, you're saying this is a good project. How do we know? We want you to put your own skin in the game. And therefore, we are going to various development banks in the OECD countries with the request that they provide some funding, possibly 10% of the funding that is needed for the purposes of solar investments. This becomes the seed investment, which then draws in, crowds in the private sector investment that is needed for these projects to take off. Together, these three buckets of funds would create an environment within which we hope to attract the private sector to start investing in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in the parts of the world where money has not been flowing as much and as easily as it should. I again thank IntelliCap for all the help that they provided us in creating this mechanism which we are now taking to our assembly in October. I thank all of you for your attention. I look forward to work with all of you and with IntelliCap in the years to come. I thank the organizers of Sankalp for uh, inviting me and regret that I'm not with you in person. But I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, we, of course, owe gratitude to Dr. Martha for taking time out for recording that address for us. After his uh, insightful address, of course, we are now ready to dive in to the discussion with our esteemed panelists. The conversation will revolve around the need for unlocking finance for solar energy in developing economies, the quantum of capital required, and the possible interventions that can effectively enable solar power deployment. The discussion will be moderated by Santosh, and I will just take a moment to to introduce him, uh, who will be leading and, and moderating this session. Uh, Santosh is a partner and managing director at IntelliCap and leads its agriculture and climate solutions practices. He has more than 20 years of experience in scaling up market-based solutions for climate change mitigation and adaptation. He has led several initiatives in shaping up energy access financing, carbon markets, and sustainable finance interventions across Asia and Africa. Over to you, Santosh. Thank you, Asa, and a, a very warm welcome to my co-panelists and the participant and uh, uh, all the people who have been part of Sankal and, and kind of presentation. Uh, we have around 40-45 uh, minutes uh, of the time for our discussion uh, in this session, and I would try to be brief in my kind of questions. I would uh, let my esteemed panel speak more, and uh, I'll quickly introduce my panel. Uh, you know, Asai, if the team can put uh, the panel on the spotlight. I think uh, that would be better. Sure, sir. Yeah, yeah. So with me, you know, I have three panelists and together they have been kind of championing the scaling up of solar in different capacities. Uh, you know, as a practitioner, as the people who practice some of the innovative things, I'm looking forward to a very engaging discussion. The first panelist, uh, a good 
uh, old friend and ex colleague uh, mr amit jain amit jain is a phd scholar uh, and a seventeen fellow at king's college london he has been with the world bank and uh, leading 2 billion renewable energy portfolio in india uh, he is also co author of a very very uh, you know insightful book on the uh, bangladesh energy access and uh, uh, he would be with us to share his insights on the work he is doing in uh, supporting the scale up of solar in different capacities across the global south uh, second panelist uh, is uh, ms ritu lal uh, Uh, she is a senior vice president and head of external and institutional relations uh, marketing and communication at amplus solar uh, she is passionate about india's renewable opportunities especially solar and is keen advocate for policy support and initiative that can maximize india adoption of clean energy amplus solar has been doing fantastic work so looking forward to hearing from uh, our panelists uh, my third panelist is a veteran in the energy access space uh, g1 uh, ataria is uh, you know working in the energy division of uh, adb as a principal energy specialist and uh, his work focuses on developing and implementing energy efficiency renewable energy and other uh, broader energy sector projects in india and south asia uh jivan if you can uh, turn on your video then we can uh, see you uh, hopefully uh, you were able to hear us clearly jivan let me know if you are able to hear me clearly okay i i think jivan might be turning on his video or, or or might have some difficulty so let me jump into the panel i think uh, i'll not put the context as uh, you know if we have to achieve our goal of a green transition if we have to achieve our goal of providing energy to all of uh, uh, people who are devoid of high quality energy access solar is going to play a critical role so there is no you know kind of discussion and debate about the role of solar and uh, dr mathur highlighted some of the challenges and the work uh, that is needed for the solar sector now i'll jump on to my first panelist uh, uh, you know uh, dr amit amit you have been leading a lot of work on scaling up solar uh, across uh, asia and several other regions and uh, as part of your job you have looked at uh, different kind of interventions different kind of uh, you know uh, support that is needed for the industry uh you know i would love to have your thoughts for four or five minutes on what are the key consideration and interventions that you think are critical to make solar scale in the emerging uh, markets it would be great to uh, have some of the kind of key examples from your own experience that you can share so that uh, you know the audience can benefit from that over to you amit thank you santosh uh before i come to your answer i don't know if you have watched a uh, game of thrones So John Snow said, "Winter is coming," and Starks were ready at that time for facing that winter. Now, in the context of Ukraine-Russia war, everybody is facing that moment. Winter is coming. Are we ready? And I can tell you, Europe for sure is not ready. So the the question I think Santosh have now moved from solar or energy transition, as Dr. Mathur mentioned. last 3 years has been very difficult for uh, all of us for energy and for climate change three patterns or trends which has now put all of us in the spot in the context of this winter question first as i mentioned ukraine russia war has uh, set the gas prices the petrol prices to record high it it is changing the dynamics of power sector energy sector forever so that is something we have to keep in mind we are all aware of what's happening second post covid the supply chain issues are leading to increase in solar and battery prices for last 10 years we have been benefiting from 90% decline in solar prices and battery prices in the last one year solar modules have increased 40% so that's the second constraint the unique constraint we all are facing so gone are the times when india was getting 2 rupees and 2.25 rupees ppa now we are looking at 3 rupees ppa so that's the second constraint we are facing third and the biggest constraint every country is now trying to manufacture locally which is a great move but it is disrupting the whole global trade 
which was ensuring cheaper and flexible renewable solar and wind all across the world. Look at the Inflation Reduction Act of United States. Look at the production link incentives in India. Every country is now trying to manufacture locally, which is fine. But in the, in the meanwhile, it is giving hard time to, to the renewable energy scenario. Well, Ritu will speak after me, but he can tell you that rooftop industry was going okay in the last couple of years, but now it is facing serious challenges in India and in many parts of the world. So I, but these are the three trends, Santosh, I wanted to bring to your attention, to everybody's attention that now the discussion has moved on from solar and energy transition. Now the question is for survival. Now the question is whether the winter will pass because what happens in Europe in winter will impact all of us. We are all living in this global world. But I would like to focus on one thing, which again, Dr. Mathur mentioned uh, on risk mitigation. And this is, I think, the role which multilaterals, including ADB and World Bank can play. And we have played. And again, I would request Ritu to uh, share the experience of the SBI solar rooftop facility in this regard. But what is risk mitigation? I'll give two specific examples, which is because rather than talking abstract, I will give two examples on where the role which multilaterals can play. Now, it is known that $1.5 trillion are required if by 2050 every year in developing economies if we have to reach net zero goal. Now, uh, Santosh, I don't have, World Bank doesn't have $1.5 trillion. I'm sure ADB doesn't have, and Government of India doesn't have that kind of money. So who brings this kind of money? Only private sector, institutional investors, and pension funds. These are the people, these are the institutions who have this kind of money. And to mobilize this investment, we have to create bankable, innovative structures on the ground, which can then appeal to this kind of investment. So what did World Bank do? Two very quick examples, one in India and one in Maldives. In Reva Solar Park, which everybody knows, we invested only $18 million in the shared infrastructure of Reva Solar Park. It mobilized $500 million from local and international investment. Look at the leveraging from 18 to 500 leveraging. Similarly, in 2016, when we partnered with State Bank of India, we put in $600 million for solar rooftop. At that time, not even concessional financing, no financing was available. And today we have five to six gigawatts of solar rooftop from 500 megawatt to five gigawatts in the last five years. And I believe, again, Ritu can correct me, that SBI solar rooftop facility has opened doors, opened the market for solar rooftop in India, where other commercial banks, ICIC Bank, Ratnakar Bank, all the other banks have opened the line of credit to solar rooftop in India. And finally, a very unique case of Maldives, while very it's, it's easy and to, to come and invest in India, we have huge country, we have economies of scale, we give a vision. But in a small country like Maldives, where, where you can attract tourists, where you can pay $1,000 per night for a water pool villa, but if you ask for any investor to come and invest in Maldives for solar and wind, the answer will be big no, because they consider investments in Maldives to be risky. So what we did, we, we developed a three-tier framework to take care of the off-taker risk in Maldives. First, we said, okay, we will give World Bank guarantees. If everything goes wrong, we will provide guarantees. Second, we said there will be a letter of credit. Third, we said there will be a funded escrow account for a six months delay payment. With this, Santosh, we were able to have a PPA price of 10 US cents in Maldives, which is higher from the World Bank point of view from the India point of view, but in Maldives, they're paying 35 US cents. So one third reduction in solar prices by providing this innovative financial framework, which again, Dr. Mathu said, are the risk mitigation instruments. So these are the role of catalyst, which multilaterals have to pay to bring in this trillions of dollars of investment. Thanks. Thank you, Amit, and thank you for giving us the uh, warning of the winter is coming and we need to kind of uh, uh, speed up on whatever we are doing. And, and uh, very glad that you kind of succinctly put a couple of examples that have been the real catalyst for the solar growth story in India. 
Uh, and I think from one multilateral to another multilateral that is uh, you know, stepping up the solar space and uh, G1 has been uh, looking at this space for quite some time. G1, uh, you know, ADB has been doing path-breaking work in many of these sectors and across uh, the countries. While Amit talked about Maldives and India's success stories, I think many countries in South Asia or in Asia are in different stages of the solar growth story. Now, if you can talk about some of the kind of challenges or the success stories uh, that has emerged from your own work or ADB's work in scaling up solar and how financial institutions, apart from just addressing to the risk uh, that uh, Dr. Mathur hinted at, Dr. Uh, Amit hinted at, what are the things that we can do further uh, to kind of scale up the solar? I think uh, uh, some concrete examples, some uh, lessons and uh, Anything on the horizon that you see as a guiding light would be a great story from you to hear. So what do you want? Uh, thank you so much. So I'm outside. I uh, do apologize if there's any background news, uh, noise or not. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, event. And then as uh, Amit already mentioned, he touched upon various aspects of it. Uh, let me just reiterate that from ADB side, uh, this uh, promotion of solar or clean energy in general, and uh, solar in particular is of a very high priority. And then uh, it has been, as you, as you have also seen, that ADB has also committed about $100 billion in climate finance. Most of that, about 60% will be on the mitigation side of it. Uh, so, so until 2030. So that shows that how much of commitment that ADB has in, in promoting so, uh, promoting clean energy. Now, as we also know that uh, many of our countries have also uh, ma uh, made a quite ambitious uh, target uh, under the climate change uh, in, in, in Glasgow COP uh, last, last year. And then that, that shows uh, that our current way of thinking is not, uh, will not take us there. So we may have to think differently. Uh, and we may have to think outside of the box uh, to be able to reach uh, that target. So in that context, that puts us a pressure to ADB and puts us a pressure to the industry, puts us to the governments and to everybody in terms of how, how do we do things differently so that we will be able to achieve uh, such, uh, such, a, such an ambitious target. So just to share some of the things that we are doing from our side uh, in ADB uh, is that uh, you know, with also with the uh, IntelliCap support, um, uh, ADB is working very closely with uh, with International Solar Alliance. Uh, and then one of the things that we are doing it is to uh, uh, undertake uh, a scoping study for South Asian countries to look at what are the issues and challenges that they are facing and how much of targets do they actually have uh, in, in in solar, for example. Uh, and then and then and then how much will be the uh, what are the prospects of getting that. Um, uh, reaching to that potential of the targets in, in these countries uh, and then also how much of money that we'll be looking at uh, in, in those areas and then of course any project that we do financing will be needed uh, but our again the, our way of uh, mobilizing financing in the uh, current way may not be sufficient so that's why we need to look at some kind of a blended risk mitigation kind of a financing maybe uh, maybe needed so this is this is what we're doing and then just to share i think our initial study shows that about uh, you know about 300 gigawatt or so of solar potential in south asia alone and we need about you know amount of like 150 billion dollar or so this large 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 chunk of resources will be will be needed uh, for, 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 for this one. So for that, you know, government's one financing, private sector financing and concessional financing from uh, MDBs like ADB, World Bank, uh, and some other local commercial financing, uh, some uh, risk mitigation facilities, risk guarantees, lots of different kind of instruments would be very much uh, needed there. And we are also very much going into this uh, floating solar now. We have received some requests from India. Uh, I think we see that as a kind of a growing, growing trend. Uh, in, in, the, in those countries and also has a high, has a high potential. Uh, but at the same time, we, do, we are not forgetting a kind of a small scale uh, solar technology, especially in rural areas and so on. And we're also looking at some kind of diversification of uh, use of solar for, um, for solar cooling and also solar based electric charging uh, and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot to, to share but I know that you may have to give some time to our other speakers as well. So let me stop it here. And this is great that you're organizing. And thank you so much for inviting us again. Thank you.
Thank you, Jivan. This is very helpful. I think uh, both ADB and World Bank have been driving the solar story in Asia, and you two have been at the forefront of that. So, after hearing from two veterans from the uh, capital side of the, or or you said the bilateral, multilateral, the DFI side of the story, I'm jumping onto uh, the enterprise side of the story. So, you know, uh, Ritu, you heard about the winter is coming, and uh, these uh, people also are talking about that they have very limited money. But you need a lot of money to kind of scale that. So two questions. One is that your story of how solar is scaling up your perspective, especially if you talk about the rooftop solar, because uh, uh, one thing has emerged clearly that in many countries, solar is driven by different segments and different kind of success stories are confined within these segments. So not all segments are growing at the same pace. So your take on which are the segments that are kind of, uh, you know, uh, matured enough to grow on their own, which segments require attention. And uh, uh, M Plus has been doing some great work. So uh, as uh, Amit plugged you in a couple of times to talk about some of the work that they have done, and, and I'm sure that if you have a growth plan for Asia, ADB and others would be uh, kind of very keen to support you. So over to you to talk about your uh, M Plus stories, uh, which segment that are very promising and how finance has been playing a critical role or, or, or your stories about how finance has enabled you to achieve those goals. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me on this extremely distinguished panel. And uh, of course, uh, finance has played a very, very massive role in where we are today. So just to give a little bit of context, uh, Amplus has largely been a distributed solar player. Uh, catering so far primarily to C&I commercial and industrial clients, fulfilling their solar requirements and, you know, going now a little beyond solar into offering low carbon solutions. And uh, we have both on-site as well as off-site solar. Uh, we were the first company of our sorts to get to sign up with both the World Bank and the ADB for their rooftop line of funding. And, uh, you know, which is why I, you know, when I was being introduced and I said, I've already, I, I know Amit Jain and we've interacted at several forums and uh, Amplus has been one of the largest beneficiaries among the rooftop players of the World Bank SBI line of funding, uh, which brings me to the problem. The ADB line actually never came through. It, it's not like it didn't come through for Amplus. But for various reasons, that line, I think, unfortunately, it stayed in, you know, in limbo for several years, four or five years, but uh, did not get utilized. This in a scenario where rooftop solar does not get bank funding. So unlike utility solar, you know, where that 18 million had such a big spin-off effect at Reva, uh, the only substantial bank funding that rooftop players have got is from the SBI World Bank line. Most of the other funding, the debt funding, is from NBFCs. There's very little. Uh, there are, you know, uh, lines that were signed up with Yes Bank and with a few others as well. But uh, the utilization has been very, very low. Uh, also, the way uh, these, you know, companies like Amplus, they came up as startups. Many of them then also got equity funding. Uh, we then got acquired by in 2019 by Petronas. So a lot of the funds that flow in are also from the equity side. Uh, rooftop solar debt funding is largely driven other than, you know, the multilats uh, by NBFCs. Uh, we have typically A-rated clients. So we sign, you know, power purchase agreements. It's uh, uh, solar as a service uh, and long-term PPAs. Typically, my clients are all A-rated, very, very solid. Despite all of that, there isn't much of a culture for banks to finance it. Uh, so you can really imagine if, you know, the top-notch players in the rooftop and distributed segment, if they struggle so much for bank finance, uh, MSMEs, residential solar, and everybody else in the distributed solar scenario I think they're really starved of finance. So uh, that is something that must be laid out at the onset. I know that the World Bank is also working on, uh, you know, the risk mitigation that uh, Dr. Amit Jain talked about. 
but uh, it's still got uh, you know there are various models for india that have been proposed but uh, we haven't really got anywhere where uh, you know we agree that these will really help meet you know uh, the requirements of financiers as well as investors as you know because we also end up becoming investors in the whole story right where we own the solar asset and we supply the energy which help us get into a you know a, a, some sort of a comfort zone to broaden the prospect of rooftop solar in india now estimates for the size of india estimates range from 125 to 210 gigawatts that we can do on rooftops alone in the country today we are sitting at not even 10 and when you talked about you know uh, which sector is doing well which sector is lagging of the 50 55 or 59 gigawatts that we've done and the numbers keep varying in solar 50 or so is utility the balance is rooftop uh, if you look at the original numbers it was 60 and 40 making up the 100 by 2022 so nowhere near the 40% ratio uh, it's not because rooftop solar is not suitable for a country like india in fact for various reasons it is probably the most suitable form of generation for india we are held back not by financing alone but the biggest challenge that we face is policy related and uh, with the kind of changes that the government has made in order to promote domestic solar manufacturing these you know there are other kinds of challenges which are coming in and kind of uh, becoming a real deterrent and a disruption and not the positive kind of disruption that we talk about these days in the sector the last point i really want to make so this morning i was in a meeting with the german solar association so when we talk about and dr mathur mentioned how you know the next decade is going to require a lot of investment and how there's a huge market in in asia in africa uh, to my surprise as a massive market even in germany and then i suppose maybe in other european countries and in the developed world so germany today has 64 gigawatts of solar of which 70% is rooftop their ambition is to get to about 250 gigawatts of solar you know other countries are also going to scale up i think you know the kind of the winter is coming the scenario that was talked about is hitting many european countries because you know the gas issue is hitting them as they are already unwinding on their nuclear story uh, after the japan uh, scenario that you know after that uh, uh, you know the what was the tsunami that came out there uh, i know that a lot of countries are moving away from nuclear for safety reasons etc but you know this disruption is still like maybe a few years probably it's going to force them to make a quicker transition and uh, in terms of adopting renewables countries like germany have always already been at the forefront but the point is that now that that finance which was already you know very very tight and there were many takers now we have takers even from the developed world going after the same finance so it's going to be increasingly more and more competitive uh, for countries like india uh, for private players and uh, for the rooftop sector i think all of us need to really uh, work together to find ways to make this sector more front friendly because it's not just the top notch large multinational and large indian corporates who can go uh, with uh, with solar today you know we're looking at individual households msmes and everybody else including uh, no uh, farmers and rural applications etc etc so we need to create some kind of an ecosystem which is so far largely lacking thank you ritu and and this is uh, the past and is evident in the way you described the story of uh, rooftop solar and the uh, challenges in accessing finance i i uh, jump on to uh, g1 uh, first because i think he had some constraint he has to uh, participate in something else but uh, g1 one uh, quick question i think uh, as we see the uh, need of the sector uh, growing and different segment have a different kind of economics different uh, segments have different kind of uh challenging and adb has been quite uh, looking at some of the innovations new approaches so uh learning from your previous experiences of financing solo and all the learning that you have what are the two three things that you are prioritizing uh which is going to be contextualized in the emerging uh, need for more and more finance and the unprecedented focus on solar and probably many of the segments which are kind of emerging like solar rooftop and many new countries 
uh, sowing desire to adopt solar. Bhutan, Maldives, and other countries are kind of sowing desire. So over to you, Jivan, to share some of the insight that uh, you have from learnings and what we can take for the future. Yeah, thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Santosh. Again, there's lots happening uh, within ADB um, in terms of uh, how best that we can respond uh, to the needs and requests uh, from our developing member countries in promoting solar. And as you rightly mentioned, the needs in India are very, very different than what the needs are in Maldives or in Bhutan or in Nepal uh, and, and so on. So there are a couple of things that uh, that we are doing it, or I would say rather we are, we are, we are, we are addressing this one through the multi uh, strategy. So for a country like India, we are looking at a large scale uh, support so that, um, uh, so that uh, you know, that gives the scale uh, and then the volume that is also required uh, for, 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 for us, for all of us. But at the same time, some innovative things like, uh, you know, using solar for agriculture pumps and so on in, within India and Bangladesh. So this is also another thing that we are looking at it. Floating solar, as I mentioned earlier, is an emerging area that we're looking at it. And we also have uh, our private sector angle. I am, I am from the public sector side of it, but our private sector is also very, very active, at least supporting these uh, private sector entities in, in providing a kind of a longer term financing assistance so that they will be able to use and make it this, the project can still be viable uh, in, in this, in this uh, context there. And other thing that I also want to mention is that uh, this um, venture capital fund and that also ADB has established and through which we're also supporting kind of a new uh, new and uh, emerging uh, entrepreneurs uh, who would be needing some kind of a support in, in getting their products up there. In addition to that, we also believe that these technological interventions are uh, very much needed as well. So this will include uh, things like, you know, for solar, for, uh, for electric EV uh, charging and solar cooling and heating and so on. So these are also some of these areas that we are also looking at uh, very, very, very closely. But at the same time, I do also want to mention that this is not only ADB alone will not be able to do this support that we require from the from the from the government and also from the technology developers, so from the players who knows the technologies. At the same time, we also uh, need uh, support to make these projects uh, viable uh, because the viability of these projects are very, very important. And I also want to mention that uh, you know there uh, there are. A lot of projects out there, uh, but uh, their readiness levels are very, very low. Uh, and that's why it takes a lot of time for us to, to, to finance uh, those projects. So we are also putting a lot of efforts in, in, in developing those projects, making them ready, uh, either for ADB financing and also from, from, from other, other sources uh, as well. I think sometimes the important thing is that there is no one solution that will fit in all of these things. We need to have a multiple strategies and approaches for different countries, for different sector, different sub-sectors. Uh, and then, you know, ADB working with the other development partners are trying to address that one. I know I'm also very pleased that a lot of things are happening right now. The momentum that we see right now in the solar space is so amazing. But at the same time, we cannot um, uh, stay quiet. And there's a lot, 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 lot still uh, to be done. And then from ADB side, we look forward to working with all of you uh, in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Jivan. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and thank you for this insight. I think uh, the $100 billion dollar would uh, go to play a you know big role in catalyzing the sector. If 18 million can uh, unlock so much value, if 100 billion could be deployed properly, I think it's a very big story for us. So thank you for participating. I do understand your challenges, uh, Jivan, but looking forward to uh, have you as part of Sankalp and uh, getting your insight and connecting with uh, Amit, I think uh, two key questions that I have uh, from the conversation right now uh, as Ritu also pointed out and, uh, you know, G1 mentioned that there is a lot of capital available. Uh, I think uh, $18 million created a huge impact in the space. And, and you have this SBI solar pipeline that you have for rooftop. Uh, the one challenge that I want you to kind of elaborate, there are many credit lines, uh, not only for solar, I'm talking for the general, uh, the DFI, you know, driven credit lines. Do you see a particular uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, or, or particular regions which made some MSMEs, some players to uh, take benefit of these lines and some could not benefit. Is there a learning that how we can make these uh, credit lines more effective? Because I think you guys have done a brilliant job in making these credit lines, uh, you know, quite, uh, you know, attractive. Uh, and, and this would be also be the question to Ritu, because you have been on the other side of the table trying to kind of avail the financing from these credit lines and this facility. 
So what would be your wish list that when we are designing these kind of interventions and what are the couple of things that we can do? So Amit, over to you on this. So Santosh, uh, according to you, we are doing a brilliant job, but Ritu still has complaints. She has two specific complaints and um, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of her. her wish Just list. to give you on that, Ritu. Yes, so Ritu does not have a complaint. The size of the problem is so big that she would never be happy unless she has uh, taken care of uh, hitting everyone in the winter. So I don't see the complaint. I see her passion talking about. Over to you, Amit. So first wish list again, uh, well, because Ritu is my client, right? So is uh, uh, residential solar rooftop and then she's talking about MSMEs. So these are real problems. And I'll be honest, when I installed a 4.6 kilowatt system from Amplus, Ritu could not offer me any debt and um, I was not keen on taking an NBFC 16% uh, loan. I may not be still a triple A rated as per Ritu standards, but still I would not go for uh, NBFC loan. The point is I went for the OPEC, uh, I went for the CAPEX model and installed everything on my own, but, but everybody could not do that. So, so in Delhi, I pay eight rupees. Uh, power and MSMEs sometimes pay between 8 to 12 rupees, still solar rooftop is not happening. So uh, to inform Ritu that now we have a $165 million loan operating with SBI on residential sector. So next time when she installs, she can offer that loan. Uh, on MSME, again, uh, building on a very innovative model, uh, which we are currently discussing with MSME ministry. I will again go into specifics, right? We we will give a World Bank will is is exploring a hundred million dollar guarantee with Ministry of MSME and CTSME. This guarantee can be passed on to any bank who will give them debt to companies like Amplus. So the biggest problem with with companies like Amplus is when they go to MSME, MSME doesn't have cash, so they will ask a developer or Amplus to put in the upfront cost and sign a PPA. Now MSME has two problems. One is the risk on which whether they are bankable or not. And second is a credit rating. So Amplus of course will have second thoughts. How can they take so much risk on equity? And then if you go to NBFCs for 16% loan, the product is not viable despite a eight to 10 rupees, which MSME pays for diesel generators or for grid. So what we're doing is we are putting a hundred million dollar guarantee to CTSME and then banks can take the World Bank guarantee and then give a concessional debt to companies like Amplus. So if the MSMEs don't pay the debt, 50% of the debt will be covered by the World Bank. We are still not covering the equity of, uh, uh, of developers, but at least bankers will be coming forward and give lends to company like Amplus. So we are we are working on this very complex and innovative instruments and in, in the next couple of months, I'm, I'm sure we will be able to launch this product after the residential product, which will give some comfort to uh, companies like uh, Amplus. But Santosh, the point is how this $100 million can leverage a billion dollars. That's the point because we cannot do everything, but if we can grow seeds and play the role of a catalyst, which is a big, big challenge for all of us. Thank you, Amit. I think, uh, uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, innovation that World Bank is leading. I just wanted to kind of highlight that uh, the guarantees and the insurance are the critical instrument and probably much more effective in leveraging market capital than any other uh, kind of financing. So that would be a great success. In fact, I would love to do a plug here for uh, my colleagues, uh, so, uh, uh, who works with Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, is trying to kind of create a similar kind of a structure to support uh, MSME in working in in textile sector, adopt solar. So Ritu, uh, you know, uh, just one uh, question that comes to uh, our mind is that with electricity being so costly and such kind of facility being available for financing for the guarantee and the market has a capital available with so many credit lines, why uh, some of the MSMEs are not able to do the transition? What we can learn from your story or what are the insights that you have that some of the MSME could, uh, you know, learn from that and probably... Uh, bilaterals and multilaterals could benefit from that to make these facilities more amenable 
to these segments of uh, uh, you know kind of MSME. I, I can recall a story I was uh, doing for the rooftop solar sometime back an assignment, and a key insight was that most of the MSME uh, came to me saying that Santos, you talk about 15, 16, 17 percent IRR. Uh, the space we operate, we have uh, if we have capital, we generate 30 to 40 percent return. So the opportunity cost is huge for the capital. And second, we don't even know where to get to go to get the ratings. I don't even understand the, these triple uh, A and uh, sub investment get ratings. So, so there are multiple segment that uh, space. So, learning from you would be very critical for many of the startups here and many of the MSA players who are in this room and who are uh, audience of Sankal. Over to you, Ritu. So, uh, a lot of the products uh, that Amit just spoke about, they've you know, uh, it's come to this point. As a result of dialogue with developers, not just like not just us, but other developers as well as you know uh, MSMEs themselves, uh, to kind of understand where the we understood where the gaps were pretty early on, right? Uh, and like he said, there is there is a double risk. That one aspect is your debt, right, and the second aspect is your equity, and your equity risk remains, right? Uh, even if you ask the World Bank themselves. The criteria that they've taken to finance Amplus projects, it's been rather stringent. You know, it's uh, uh, despite uh, us trying to say that you should do, you know, the, the portfolio and the bouquet of projects, you know, where we can put in, uh, a, you know, a, a, a good a selection of highly rated with a few not so highly rated projects club together to kind of mitigate the risk. It doesn't really get taken as a portfolio. Banks are very, very, very hesitant. Okay, and the other thing is that in distributed solar, the ticket size is very small. Now in large CNI, if the average ticket size is less than a megawatt, you know, I don't even think the average is 500 kilowatt. Now for MSMEs, the average would be like some 70, 80 kilowatt. Many were ranging from 50 to 70 kilowatts, right? And to do piece by piece financing at that level. Probably the size becomes so small that despite the attractiveness and other features, banks don't get involved. The third thing that comes across is the tenor gap, you know, because here is something which will perform for 25 years, whereas long term debt is like 10 years. Uh, even for people trying to avail residential solar loans, uh, there are banks asking for the house as collateral. Now, you know, if you're going to put a rooftop solar in your house, I don't think anybody is going to be happy to put the entire house as collateral. Right. So there are a lot of challenges. Uh, we also try to look at even for the residential space where we sell the systems. We try and find measures by which we can make, uh, you know, finance more accessible to our clients. Because not everybody is able to invest the capital, you know, uh, at uh, the very get go. Um, the other issues that are there are coming from uh, lack of policy support. So I think financiers are also very jittery because the government has not really supported rooftop solar in the manner that it was uh, required. And that has nothing to do with the viability or the suitability of rooftop solar. It is to do with a very different heritage problem of how subsidies are disbursed. I'm not here sitting here challenging the need for subsidized electricity. That's entirely a government political call in a country with such high income inequities. I cannot sit here and say don't subsidize something for anybody who's, who needs it or who, you know, the governments decide need it. The issue is in getting the utility discoms, right, to disburse that subsidy and then to find the recovery from that, the losses that they make from this subsidy disbursement through C&I clients, including MSMEs. So when these CNI clients start to take renewable energy of their own, whether through on-site or whether through off-site open access, it hits the revenues and you know of distribution companies who have already been distressed much before the solar revolution began in India. Now we somehow need to address and plug this basic issue. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. You know, you're going to sit with a scenario of acquiring land of getting into issues of ecological uh, nature and other such things and miss out on the low-hanging fruit that rooftop solar is. Otherwise, if you look at all the large solarized countries in the world, the countries that got there early from, you know, Japan in the east to USA in the west to, you know, uh, Germany in Europe, 
uh, Australia again in the east, the percentage of rooftop solar as a total percentage of uh, their entire solar portfolio is much, much higher. Australia is not lacking for land. 75% of their energy uh, rooftop of their solar energy is coming from rooftop. So our issues are very, very different. We're sitting lagging at less than 10 gigawatt where we have opportunities of anywhere between 100 and 200. So I would urge, you know, every uh, policymaker and every influencer to get this message across to our policymakers and government, to regulators, etc., uh, to look more futuristically, to ensure that, you know, we get the best solution. Uh, the last point I really want to make is, you know, people do a very unfair comparison of costs. When you look at the two point whatever or the three rupee cost of generation that we have for utility solar, that's at the point of injection. If I were to compare the, the same cost at the point of sale, rooftop solar generation cost would, would be very, very equitable, maybe even superior because you don't have losses, etc. Right? Employability is seven is to one. You don't have any ecological challenges. You're not getting into any endangered species territory. Cleaning, maintenance, everything is easier because you're building up in already built up areas. So uh, in a country where land is so expensive and has so many other utilization uh, requirements, I think we are missing a very, very big part. I know it's great to get focused on the 100 goal and we're saying, okay, as a country, we'll achieve that 100 irrespective of whether it's 60, 40 or 90, 10. But in doing so, it may not be in, in following that trajectory going ahead when we're going towards 350 or 500, perhaps that not be, that may not be the best solution for the country going ahead. Thank you, Ritu. I think uh, just to summarize uh, what you said, uh, you know, um, we have to look at the rooftop solar in a very different light because it has its own benefit. It has its own kind of growth trajectory and it requires a different treatment. I think there is no denying on that. Also, it's clear that we have to achieve the large scale potential of solar. Every segment of solar, every type of solar uh, energy production, solar solution has to grow. We are not going to achieve that, you know, solar growth story by just focusing on, you know, a megawatt scale uh, power park, uh, solar park. Uh, all are needed, but they have a different challenge. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions. So I think, uh, Amit, I'll, I'll, in the you know, I'll start with you and you can re respond to Ritu, but there are some questions coming from the audience and we have uh, around five to eight minutes left. Uh, but just to give you some perspective, I think uh, from our work that we have been doing, it is very clear that uh, the affordability of the MSME sector, uh, of the energy financing and what is available in the market, there's a big gap of five to seven percent. Only few are able to get the finance at the rate that they are uh, kind of amenable with. So most of the others, as Amit, you did not decide to go for an NBFC financing and you paid from your own uh, money. Most of people are not able to get the NBFC financing because of the different challenges. So one key message here is that how to kind of unlock the potential of those power consumers who could benefit from the solar uh, sector and that Ritu and you and everyone has been aligning. Now, Ritu, you did answer a question uh, which was from the audience that what role the policies uh, and the government play in the uh, development of these sectors. I think uh, policies and these sect you know, uh, the government support uh, plays a huge role uh, in this sector. So that goes beyond uh, saying. Uh, there's a question that is not uh, kind of addressed to a particular panelist, but it's saying that considering the lack of limited finance for enterprises, what are the challenges that multilateral agencies uh, face in enabling low cost finance for solar in countries of Southeast Asia? Uh, Amit, this is a question at the multilateral and bilateral that in principle, you are trying to provide the capital at the cheapest cost possible. What are the things that kind of, you know, pose a challenge when you want to deploy the development capital in the, uh, you know, kind of cheapest or, or the best possible way? Any thoughts on that? There's a question from the audience. Okay, let me try to combine the first and third question in a similar direction. See, first we have to understand the the financing problem for MSME is not a solar rooftop problem. MSMEs face challenge in general to get financing. Okay, solar rooftop is only complicating the matters because uh, it's distributed and then 
uh, it's not the first priority for MSME, right? So, so th th that's the th that's why when World Bank did solar rooftop, first we went for a relatively easier market, which is commercial industrial, then the difficult residential, and now the most difficult, which is MSME. So that's first thing we have to understand. Now we are doing two, three things. In addition to providing that guarantee framework, which I described earlier, we are planning to do aggregation. Now, if I bring one MSME to Ritu, she may or may not be interested because it's a 30, 40 kilowatt. So what we are doing is, for example, in Mandi Deep in Madhya Pradesh, or for that matter, any industrial cluster for auto or textile you mentioned, we will select that region and we will do a satellite mapping of that region and bring the product size to a 10 megawatt plus scale in the cluster of MSMEs. And on that cluster of MSMEs, we will provide stapled financing potentially from SBI if possible. And also on top of that, a guarantee framework. That kind of aggregation is very important to attract players like Amplus because for them also, it, we have to be practical. It's not, they can't do piece by piece meal, right? So it has to be some scale. So once this kickstart in one of the regions, I am very hopeful that other regions will start copying because Santosh, there is a, what keeps surprising me even now, despite being a clear business case, uh, my PPA price of my solar rooftop on my house is 4 rupees. For MSME, which is paying 10 rupees, it will be even cheaper because it is demand aggregated and from a potential concessional loan, but it is still not happening despite being a clear business case. And when we in India are known to be coming up with very innovative financial solutions, we are still struggling. And I use the word still struggling in, in rooftop sector in, in many sectors. And where we have stopped, as Hitu mentioned, we have targeted all the AAA rated clients, the, the IT companies, the you know, blue chip companies. But from, from going from there to one or two level down, it's, it, it is challenging. And that's the reason I feel that these innovative structures are required. Ritu, any any plug on this? I think uh, uh, one of the key things that I would love, a very short answer, uh, have we tried the credit enhancement kind of a structure where uh, those who are not triple A, I mean, triple A is uh, something that not many companies can afford right now. You know, there are a lot of you know, challenges. So is there a way that we can think of a structures where a double A or a double B plus could be elevated to, uh, you know, higher levels of credit rating and then they can get financing? Ritu, your quick response to the question that, uh, you know. Okay, first of all, triple A is just a matter of speech. Okay, uh, you have A rated, you even have triple B plus okay. clients, right? Uh, but of course, servicing on a solar as, you know, that solar as a service model, where the entire investment and risk is yours, as when I say yours, it's the M pluses, and you have a long term PPA. So your exposure goes 15, 20, 25 years. And you will only be solvent if your client pays you on time every month, month after month for up to 25 years, obviously the credibility of the client comes into play, right? There is no getting away from that. Uh, this does not become such an issue in developed markets where even individuals who default on debt, you know, it goes into their records and it, it has rather draconian repercussions on anything that they want to do with any bank or financing later on. We really don't have such you know, tight scenarios or monitoring in the country as yet. But I think eventually we are also have, going to have to get there, right? Because there's a limit to how much some third party is going to come hold your hand and give you, you know, that kind of support. Because there also, you know, it's not going to be entirely, everything is not going to be entirely successful. There will be failures, there will be losses. A lot of these organizations may end up becoming insolvent going forward in the future. The one challenge is, you know, unlike with assets like cars and other things which can be possessed, uh, the solar plant gets affixed to the rooftop. And removing it from there is A, financially not very viable because you only recover 50% of the costs. And B, in removing those solar modules, you void the warranties because you can end up damaging it. They're very, very delicate, made of glass. And you can end up getting micro cracks and also it's not like you can, I can take them out of location A and put them into location B. 
because the manufacturer's warranty performance warranty gets voided so these are some of the issues that we have uh, which is obviously why there have not been any easy answers if there were such easy answers given how attractive the market is and how much of a need there is and how much of a size they can fulfill a uh, lot of people would have got there if not am plus there you know it's it's the distributed solar market is literally very distributed in terms of number of players and the size of capacities they play thank you ritu i think uh, this is a topic that we can discuss uh, for hours and hours because of the criticality of the situation as well as the kind of big challenge we are trying to solve but uh, having you know you uh, three of you talk about the sector and talk about the intervention that is coming it, it gives a lot of kind of hope amit uh, your mention of this 100 million dollar facility and the aggregation approach that you are having to you looking at the sector in a very very uh, a kind of different lens of uh, working at the challenges that you could solve by uh, your own uh, innovations uh, we are very hopeful that not only rooftop solo but we will borrow the learning from our previous experiences to other segments and make them scale uh, just to kind of close the session uh, some of us we have been trying to kind of look at some of the project that you have and uh, uh, ritu there are many people who have uh, you know so an interest in reaching out and knowing more about m plus solutions uh, uh, you know that they can benefit from uh, i would urge them to reach out to you on social media or on whoa platform where uh, they can reach out to you or or they can write a mail to us and we can connect you uh, you know to them i mean more than happy to help them out yes Thank and you. i mean a lot of work happening on the uh, you know kind of understanding the financing nuances for msme sector i completely agree to your remark that it's a msme financing challenge uh, and not only a rooftop financing challenge so we have to kind of address that but thank you very much for being uh, you know very very candid very insightful and uh, giving a passionate uh, you know uh, region for us to kind of uh, look very hopefully at the rooftop solar space and the solar space in general uh, looking forward to having you at sankalp and uh, your participating in other session uh, we look forward to having you uh, in some other conversation on solar uh, to take the industry forward thank you very much and thank you uh, the participants and audience for providing us the questions and the comments and uh, apologies for not able to kind of give you all the questions but i think many of the questions were answered by our uh, you know panelists so uh, enjoy sankalp looking forward to having you on some other session thank you bye